welcome. Welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome as well to our audience um, following us on the internet. Uh, as you know, it's a, a live webcast this evening. Um, my name is Vincent Bernard. I'm the editor-in-chief of the International Review of the Red Cross based in, in Geneva at the International Committee of the Red Cross. I'm also in charge of organizing a, a cycle of events. Uh, this is one of them on uh, new technologies and the modern battlefield. Uh, I'd like first to, to thank especially the Australian Red Cross and the Asia Pacific Center for Military Law for hosting this event. And of course, thank all the panelists and uh, Helen Durham who has accepted to, to moderate the discussion this evening. So as I told you, this event is, is part of a cycle of events which, which actually followed our work on new technologies and warfare. There was a, a, an issue of the International Review of the Red Cross on this topic. Um, here it is. I guess that some of you could uh, get a copy outside the room. And of course, um, this is also part of the interest that the International Committee of the Red Cross has on developments in the field of means and methods of warfare. Since many, many decades, the ICRC has been following um, developments in the field of warfare because we are interested in their humanitarian consequences and in the development of the law, wherever there are gaps, there are needs to clarify, or there are needs also to apply the law, the existing law, to evolving realities of the modern battlefield. So this is part of this uh, ongoing efforts in which we are not alone. There are many organizations joining us and also the Australian Red Cross has been very active in this field. So we have had uh, several events, uh, just for you to, to know that uh, it's not the first one. We have had a first event at the Humanitarium, our new conference center in Geneva. Um, and then we moved the cycle to Washington DC where we discussed uh, autonomous weapons. We had a webinar in Boston uh, and we organize all these different events with various partners. Now we are here in Melbourne for the discussion on human enhancement and uh, humanitarian consequences and the law. And the cycle will continue with two more events at the end of July, one which will be on uh, humanitarian action and new technologies because that's also another dimension of uh, uh, modern conflict and new, and new technologies. There are also many uh, use of new technologies for humanitarian action. And then we will end the cycle uh, with a high level panel where we will discuss all the various issues, all the various techniques, new technologies uh, that we cover during these events. So you can find more information on this cycle on our uh, website on icrc.org. And, um, and I invite you to, to continue the discussion also looking at our issue of the journal which is available online. Um, let me now uh, introduce our moderator. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Helen Durham. Well, because she's not only an editorial board member of our journal, so I know her well for the support she has brought to our journal, but she will soon take up the position of Director of International Law and Policy at the ICRC in Geneva. So she will be the first Australian appointed to any ICRC directorship uh, in the history of the organization and it started in 1863. So you see that it was high time to have uh, an Australian coming to Geneva. So Ellen has uh, worked until now um, uh, for the Australian Red Cross as director of IHL, Strategy, Planning and Research. And she's a senior fellow at Melbourne Law School. Uh, so I will let Ellen introduce uh, our panel this evening and, and present the subject. And well, I'm, I'm really very curious to, to listen to all of them because this topic has not been uh, the object of much attention. So actually, there has not been much work and discussion on this topic and on uh, the, its legal dimensions. And I'm quite confident that we'll have more and more of these discussions in the future. Uh, so I'm really uh, excited about our discussion. And I thank you all for, for your attendance. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. And I'd like to uh, start off in a very traditional Australian way by respectfully acknowledging 
the traditional elders of this land for which we sit and talk about high technologies and I have no doubt that in their way they had extraordinary technologies to survive and look after this uh, beautiful country so well. Well, humanity is constantly evolving to heal and to harm. New technologies, human enhancement is something that we would not want to live without. Who wants to live in a world without penicillin or the capacity to have the evolving technology of fabulous coffee machines in the morning that do it really well? Our capacity to use technology to make the world a better and safer place is extraordinary. And I think science nowadays, perhaps more than ever, but certainly, um, certainly significantly, has a big influence over our lives, over the way society is constructed, and um, even over the way we conceptualise how we deal with each other. But what we're here tonight to reflect upon is how science and technology, and in particular, as was expressed, human enhancement, how does that paradigm play out on the battlefield? How do the issues relate to the methods and means of warfare, as well as the way we look at each other as combatants, so to speak, as arms bearers, how does this enhancement of humanity or human technology actually assist, create challenges, and also provide some really important questions, be they legal, operational, or ethical? It's a great honour to chair tonight's session because we have three fantastic, uh, fantastic speakers, each of them with a different perspective. Um, if I can start at, at the, my left hand, we've got um, a, 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 a gentleman who's spent much time and is considering this topic at the moment, Dr. Ryan um, Liver, Livia. I'm not so great with my pronunciation. Um, but uh, Ryan is a senior lecturer at Melbourne Law School and he's also the project director for the Law of Armed Conflict at the Asia Pacific Centre for Military Law. He's a member of the Emerging Technologies of Warfare Research Group at the APCML. Really important group, and I see a number of members in the audience here tonight um, that are involved in that work. And what that work is doing is seeking to identify the um, hostile uses of computer networks, robotics, nanotechnology, and others that raise issues relating to humanitarian objectives of IHL and to evaluate the compatibility of these technology with the existing normative legal framework. So how is this evolving impacting upon IHL? We'll hear from um, Ryan first, but I thought I might introduce all three panellists before we, uh, we got into the discussions. The next panellist is Group Captain Ian Henderson. Now he is currently the Director of the Military Law Centre and Deputy Director of the Asia Pacific Centre for Military Law. He has a very important role because he's responsible for training or the legal training of Australian military lawyers, commanders and delivering legal training to regional militaries. So a really significant role to play, particularly I would say from an operational slant. And finally we will hear tonight from uh, Dr Ned Dobos who is a lecturer at the UNSW in Canberra and he received a PhD in philosophy from the University of Melbourne in 2009. And he's also worked at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. So we've got the legal, the operational, and the ethical. And what we want to do tonight is really to encourage debate and discussion. So I'll ask each of our panellists to only speak for approximately five minutes to really throw out or lie down the foundations of the key issues in their area and then we'll be taking um, some questions. And not only from you lovely audience here, but I also will be taking questions from our um, uh, online audience. And I would encourage anyone online to send in their, uh, their uh, question by Twitter, I believe they can do it by Twitter, um, with the hashtag new tech. So we're uh, practicing what we're preaching by utilizing new technologies as well as the, uh, the human interface. But before we got started, I did want us to reflect on two things. One is that we often learn a lot about the future by reading science fiction writers. And in fact, some of the stuff we're talking about tonight is very much in the realms, or looks like it's in the realms of science fiction. But the sobering thing written by one fabulous science fiction writer was the statement that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. 
So this idea about we can have these fantastic advances in technologies, but how do we harness that and make sure it's embedded in ideas of wisdom and the ideas of, of what we try to do in the, uh, in the International Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, be it ICRC or national societies, which is really make sure that the humanitarian issues are squarely part of the debate, as well as all these other factors. So some things for us to think about before we go any um, further, but I would like to ask uh, Ryan to address us on his particular topic, which is looking at some of the legal issues. Uh, thanks very much, Helen, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you all for taking the time to come here tonight or to be with us um, virtually. Um, so I'm here to address some of the legal issues involved in human enhancement in the military context. And the difficulty with making inroads into this discussion uh, is perhaps uh, twofold. On the one hand, when we talk about human enhancement, whether it is in, in the military context or in the civilian context, the difficulty is that there's a variety of technologies that is being used to achieve various purposes. So for example, we have pharmacological interventions, um, giving certain drugs to soldiers to enhance their performance. There can be surgical uh, interventions, such as, for example, laser surgery to correct um, or enhance vision. Uh, there's poten potentially uh, genetic um, modification or then technological um, tools to assist soldiers such as, for example, uh, systems controlled by uh, brain-machine interfaces, for example, exoskeletons that soldiers can wear to um, enable them to carry greater weights and, and, and travel further. Um, and these technologies or these interventions have different results. They can improve the physical strength of people, enhance soldiers in, in that way. They can enhance the sen senses, um, improve vision, for example, or they can improve resilience. So, for example, allow soldiers to uh, undertake um, longer missions. So that is one of the problems, the, the technological uh, diversity. And, and the, the other problem results from that, namely there is no discrete conceptual box into which we could put human enhancement in the um, legal context or in the context of armed conflict. Uh, that is because human enhancements are not directly weaponized. We're not talking about drones, for example, which are a, a, a new type of, uh, of, of, of weapon system, a new type of aircraft um, to attack the enemy. We are talking about improving certain qualities of our own soldiers. So the, the paradigm of the law of armed conflict, which deals, for example, with uh, the principle of distinction, who can be shot at and who cannot be shot at, uh, and, and the, the rules of proportionality uh, and protection of, of prisoners of war doesn't really lend itself so well to regulating um, um, human enhancement. There is one legal instrument, though, that deals with human enhancement in passing uh, in the context of armed conflict. Um, and that is the uh, fourth protocol to the 1980 Convention on uh, Certain Conventional Weapons. And that protocol prohibits certain laser weapons. And the crucial provision of that protocol is its Article 1, which says, and I quote, it is prohibited to employ laser weapons specifically designed as their sole combat function or as one of their combat functions to cause permanent blindness to unenhanced vision that is to the naked eye or to the eye with corrective eyesight devices. And they say, end quote. And these are, there are various aspects of this provision that we might consider, but our interest in particular is uh, in the notion of unenhanced vision. So weapons specifically designed to cause permanent blindness in un unenhanced vision um, are prohibited under this protocol. And this raises the question, what does unenhanced vision mean? What kind of vision is enhanced and what kind of vision isn't? So the protocol was designed to exclude devices such as um, uh, glasses, obviously, but also, for example, uh, night vision goggles. But the problem still remains as to what is enhanced and what is unenhanced in the context of uh, vision. 
Now, normal vision is generally defined as 2020 or 66 on the Snellen chart, invented by the good Dr. Herman Snellen, a Dutch ophthalmologist in 1862. But that's a fairly random measure. It basically means that a person can see at six feet or six, sorry, at 20 feet or at six meters, what a person is supposed to see at 20 feet or six meters. So the, the measurement itself is, is fairly random. Moreover, the 2020 vision is not really the statistical average for normal human vision. And let's do a bit of um, audience participation. Um, how many of the people here either use glasses, contact lenses, or have had some form of refractive surgery? Can you put up your hand? There you go. So according to the University of Iowa um, researchers, only about 35% of all adults actually have 2020 or 66 vision. So the vision that we consider normal is actually statistically fairly rare. So the question is that one, what should we then treat as enhanced vision? Uh, vision corrected beyond 2020? Or is it vision corrected beyond what is the normal range of human vision? Because some human beings see better than 2020. And the, other, and the same question can be asked with, with all kinds, kinds of other aspects of vision. So for example, uh, low light vision, uh, peripheral vision, and so on and so forth. So the fundamental question in, in, in our debate, for example, is when does correction or, or treatment or healing actually become uh, enhancement? The protocol also points us towards a second issue which has more broader uh, legal implications. So if a weapon is designed to cause permanent blindness in enhanced vision, it doesn't fall under the prohibition of the protocol. So if we actually design weapons against uh, super soldiers with eagle vision, then those weapons would not be captured by that protocol. But what happens if we then use the same weapons against uh, ordinary soldiers? Would that prohibition then capture those kinds of weapons? Because the problem there is that we wouldn't have then developed those weapons specifically to cause permanent blindness in unenhanced vision, but rather to cause blindness in enhanced vision. So the problem is that when we have human enhancement, we will have or counter-enhancement technologies, if you will. There will be ways in which the adversary will find ways to overcome the uh, enhancements that one of the parties to the conflict has, has put in place. And that can lead potentially to fairly uh, a nasty technology, uh, which then leads to the question or the, the issue that, well, even if human enhancement as such may be legal, that is to say not prohibited by the law of armed conflict, do we actually really want it? Or, as this question has been put by um, Harold Cole, a former State Department legal advisor uh, 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 numerous times in, different, in a different context, perhaps this is something that is lawful but awful. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose my first point is I really have to learn not to be on panels with Lion. Uh, the best I could come up with was don't treat them as a single class. And English is allegedly my first language. Mm -hmm. And you had discrete conceptual box, which is fantastic. <laughs> and what, third language? Fourth? Yes. <laughs> also, uh, don't let the uniform fool you. Uh, I have to give the normal disclaimer. Uh, the following isn't necessarily the views of the Department of Defence uh, or the Australian government. For that matter, they may not even be my own. Uh, this is very much an evolving area. Uh, and I suspect anything I say tonight, uh, I would disagree with myself next week. Just how we like it. <laughs> yeah. But I would like to uh, make one uh, semi-proper citation, which I can't in the time available. But uh, there's certain members of the audience here from the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. They have been very helpful in me preparing some of these background notes, and I do thank you in particular. 
As Ryan's already mentioned, human enhancement comes in multiple forms. The interesting point for me is I think that it also comes in short term and long term. So drug based enhancements or devices that aren't permanently affixed or grafted would be a temporary measure. But if you're doing gene-based technology, if you're adding prosthetics to the person as opposed to an exoskeleton, uh, if it's a replacement eye as opposed to a third eye, um, this is something that now becomes integral to the person. And I suspect that will affect uh, some of the issues I'm about to raise. The other point that I think will be interesting with time is that while some of this development is going on in the military, it's very much going on in civil society as well, like most of the technological advancements that we're interested in are. But the difference will be that unlike with developments in cyber technology or autonomous weapons or autonomy, uh, where defence could choose to employ it or not. Some of this human enhancement will be the recruiting pool. These people will present to the military already with um, some of the longer term things. Corrected vision at the moment, uh, enhanced vision in the future. And uh, treatments to improve their strength, their endurance, those sorts of things that aren't drug-based but gene-based will just be part of civil society. And that will, again, I believe, affect the analysis. When we look to the law of armed conflict, we normally distinguish between means and methods. Means generally being weapons, methods generally being tactics, techniques, procedures. This will somewhat blur the line, but I would generally put it into the methods box. Unless the enhancement of the person has a form of direct lethality, uh, unless we've enhanced their ability to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat or the like, what we're probably doing is improving the tactics and techniques that they can employ when using weapons. The interesting part about that is under Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1, there's a requirement to do a legal review, not just of weapons, but also means and methods of warfare. So if you conclude that the technology ha um, affects the way that warfare is conducted, i.e. the methods employed, it becomes subject to a positive black letter law requirement to conduct a legal review under additional protocol one. Uh, in my background reading before today, generally most of the commentary related to things like uh, distinction, proportionality, causing unnecessary suffering. I'd like to point out that there are also just some specific other law of armed conflict rules that may be relevant, particular treatment of prisoners of war. If one of the enhanced soldiers is captured and taken as a prisoner of war, how will that affect the treatment regime? If they have super hearing, if they have eyesight that is in effect a built-in night vision goggle and maybe also infrared and maybe hyperspectral. If their ear isn't just enhanced, but is also a radio. So they uh, have the ability to at least receive external communications uh, as part of their body. So we have to look at more than just the typical offensive rules of, will this person be able to do something to the enemy, but also how should they be treated? Um, we'll also have to look at how the person integrates into the battlefield. If we're moving towards human-machine interfaces, then a person who's wounded 
and who might otherwise be what's known as whore to combat, out of the fight, and therefore not subject to lawful attack. But if, again, if their eyes, their ears, whatever senses have been integrated into their body are automatically feeding into the intelligence surveillance picture for the battlefield, then are they truly out of the fight just because they personally aren't actively taking a part? Equally, there's technology being developed that would allow the remote control of a weapon system uh, just by thinking about it. So a person might appear to be unable to continue to participate, but in actual fact is still controlling a remote weapon system. The other area that I think will need a lot of um, thought, uh, particularly on the biological side and sociological side, is what effects will some of these technologies, uh, and particularly the drug-based ones or the ones that uh, stimulate parts of the brain have, on whether the person has an altered perception of what amounts to humane treatment. So what, now not what the person's receiving, which is one of the discussions, if they're an enhanced soldier, they're stronger, they can withstand pain, those sorts of things. But if someone is awake for 48 hours, 96 hours, and by all observable uh, physiological measures uh, appears alert, but will their brain nonetheless be making some different assumptions about uh, what's appropriate in the circumstances, knowing that a lot of decisions at the moment under the law of armed conflict are subjective in nature. What is proportional collateral damage? Semi-subjective, whether you think that someone is participating directly in hostilities based on your observation of them. So some of those are less black and white criteria may be uh, a fruitful area of consideration uh, as we try and come up with already difficulties in cultural understandings, but now it may not just be a cultural thing, but also a dividing line between the, the haves and the have-nots in the enhancement area. So they are the issues that I see, uh, and I look forward to discussing them. Thanks, Helen. Well, I've got a tough act to follow. Um, so I'm a military ethicist, and we're concerned with all three levels of armed conflict, from the initiation of war, so the waging of war by politicians, uh, to the conduct of soldiers once hostilities are underway, uh, to post-war reconstruction and the re-socialization of soldiers uh, into civilian society once they return from war. So in what limited time I have, I'm going to try and say something about at all three levels of analysis. Uh, but noting that this doesn't capture all of the ethical issues that might be raised by these sorts of uh, technologies. So, for example, we, we might want to ask, <clears throat> is it justifiable for the military to enhance soldiers without their consent? That falls outside of the, the framework that I'm going to be uh, pitching my, my discussion at, but perhaps we can pick up on some of those themes in, in the discussion that follows. So let's start with this basic question. Why enhance our soldiers? What's the rationale for it? Pretty obvious answer, we want them to be more effective and efficient in achieving their collective purpose, which is to win wars and to successfully prosecute humanitarian interventions. Now the benefit of that is the ultimate aim is to re reduce the human and material costs of our military operations, to help our soldiers win their victories more quickly and decisively, and to reduce the costs of our military operations. You might think, how could that possibly be a bad thing? There was an American Civil War general, Stephen Lee was his name, and he once said, it's a good thing that war is so horrendous, otherwise we would grow too fond of it. And here comes the first objection to the use of these technologies in the military context. The worry is, if we reduce the human and material costs of war, we might become more inclined to wage war. 
it might become increasingly normalized in our collective psyche. Since it wasn't as catastrophic, since it's not as catastrophic as it once was, it, it might become more palatable to the general public. Okay, so that's, that's the first argument of the, of the naysayers. I don't think it's a particularly good argument. Maybe we can pick up on it later, but that's the first argument. The second worry relates to the conduct of soldiers once hostilities are, are already underway. Now, military ethicists usually use a normative framework called just war theory. It dates back to the, middle, to the Middle Ages. A core principle of just war theory is what's called the principle of civilian immunity. It's been referred to as the principle of distinction by my, my co-panelists. And uh, the idea crudely is that only enemy combatants are legitimate targets of attack. Uh, innocent civilians must not be deliberately harmed, even if there is some military utility in doing that. At the Pentagon right now, pharmacologists are investigating a few beta blocking drugs which they hope will prevent the formation of traumatic memories in soldiers. Prevent the formation of traumatic memories. The intention is to make soldiers more resilient to post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental afflictions that are associated with combat. The way that these drugs work is important. What they do is they silence the emotions. Right? So someone takes the drug, then they witness an emotionally arousing or disturbing event they remember the details of the event, but they have a flat emotional response to the event. So the drugs don't prevent the formation of traumatic memories, strictly speaking. They prevent trauma from attaching to the memory by numbing the emotions. So what's the, the ethical problem here, or the potential ethical problem? Well, take any modern military, you'll find some bad apples, psychopaths, and people that are disposed to, to commit war crimes, but you'll also find a whole lot of decent, ordinary people. So let's focus on these, these people. These decent people will have an innate inhibition against killing innocent civilians. If you look at Dave Grossman's book on the psychology of killing, that's what it shows. In most ordinary people, there's an uh, innate emotional backlash against killing non-threatening members of your own species. If these pharmacological enhancements we're talking about would put our decent soldiers in a state of emotional deadness, will they lose that inhibition? Will they become emotionally indifferent to civilian casualties and therefore more likely to victimize civilians or at least uh, less likely to bother trying to protect civilians from the horrors of war? But there's another side to this story. A lot of the civilian victimization that happens in war occurs as a result of what is sometimes called battlefield frenzy. And this is where soldiers become emotionally overwhelmed in the heat of battle and commit crimes of rage, they call them. Right? So soldiers lose their heads and start killing indiscriminately. In that case, it may be in the best interest of civilians if our soldiers are rendered unemotional before going to war. I'll leave that as an open question, but my point here is that there are considerations pulling in, in both directions here. In one way, making our soldiers more emotionally resilient might endanger civilians by making our troops more indifferent to human suffering. Uh, but in, a, in another respect, these enhancements might help protect enemy civilians. OK, so I've said something about the resort to war uh, and about the, the conduct of soldiers in war. I'll say something about post-war resocialization re of soldiers into civilian society. Uh, and the key point here is that every soldier is a potential veteran. We want them to survive and to be reintegrated into society and even to have a post-military civilian career. Now suppose that before sending our soldiers off to battle, we use gene therapy or pharmaceuticals or neural implants that enable better data retention, faster information, inf information processing, improved vision, whatever the case may be. Years later, these people come home from war and enter civilian society. More specifically, they enter the civilian job market. And they're competing for scarce jobs. And they're competing with the likes of you and I, ordinary unenhanced people. So now the question is, is this a fair contest? What happens to notions of meritocracy and equal opportunity and a level playing field and a fair go when we have in our midst this new class of cognitively enhanced citizen citizens competing for jobs and contracts and university placements. 
Right? So these people will have a competitive advantage in many walks of life, and it's the state that has given them that advantage. So the state's activities in the military domain might contaminate civil society in ways that we think are undesirable. Uh, these two areas of state activity can't be cleanly separated. Perhaps there are things we can do to counter these worries. So maybe we can decide that all enhancements must be reversible and should be reversed routinely as a matter of course upon discharge from the military. But uh, these solutions raise ethical issues of their own. First, it would mean denying veterans their right to refuse invasive procedures and coercing them if need be to, re to remove the implant or the enhancement that, the that has been administered to them. And what about those enhanced soldiers uh, that have become so accustomed to their enhancement that they'll actually be impaired were it to be suddenly removed. So they've forgotten how to live without it. Finally, maybe the right to remain enhanced after going to war is something that soldiers should be entitled to as a kind of just reward for their service. And maybe the military can use that as a legitimate recruiting incentive. I don't know what you think about that, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much to the three panellists. I think obviously so many more questions and answers were raised, but I think that capacity to explore an issue in, in some detail, not to get, if I may say, a sound bite or a Twitter or a, a short snap of information, to actually spend some time um, hearing from people who have reflected on this, I think is one of the really, really excellent things about the International Review and these, these uh, this, this, this series of events. Um, so with that, I um, know that we've got the capacity to get questions from the audience, but um, I was just wondering whether we had any from our friend, the audience online as yet, if there's any questions that might be asked in that way. Um, as we're doing that, because I've got two things to, uh, to announce. One is, could people please wait for the microphone before they speak, because that's the only way we're going to let our colleagues or friends online to hear. Um, but the other thing was that um, whilst we're ready for the online question, there is the capacity for us to have a little bit of a chat amongst ourselves first. And to, uh, um, I think I'll, I'll take the chair's prerogative to ask uh, a question to each of you. But please feel free to, um, to move those questions amongst uh, each of you if you want to answer another one. Um, Ryan, with your very beautifully precise and clear uh, description about some of the, at least the, the elements of illegal uh, issues that were raised there, I was wondering, it, it builds on a question that issue that Ian raised, do you think that uh, an enhanced soldier would require the same level of protection under IHL as, as um, a mere mortal like the rest of us? Do you think there is any legal elements, and it's a bit putting you on the spot, that would talk about it the other way around, not that they do um, further or perpetrate potential issues in the way they, they fight, but should they be having a limited or, or more, the concept, for example, of superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, Article 35, uh, Judicial Protocol 1, should that apply in the same way if someone can, for example, um, withstand pain at a much higher level? Does the concept of superfluous suffering have the same elements that we would traditionally have thought about? Um, so, so, so yes, I do think that enhancements play a role in what level of protection um, soldiers should be entitled to. But interestingly, this can work in both ways. In some circumstances, they might be um, entitled to a lower degree of protection, perhaps, than normal soldier, soldiers, but in other contexts to a greater degree of protection. So. In a, in a targeting scenario, um, uh, as you pointed out, the question is uh, whether the, the, a weapon or a means of warfare that's being used against an enhanced soldier is um, of a nature to cause superfluous injury. But if the weapon has been, or means of warfare, has been specifically designed so as to incapacitate enhanced soldiers, then we can't really say that that particular weapon or means of warfare is of a nature to cause uh, uh, unnecessary suffering. But it might cause unnecessary suffering to uh, normal, unenhanced uh, soldiers. So there seems to be something of a, of a, of a difference there. But the other scenario is uh, the, the, the situation that, that Ian alluded to, which is when the enhanced soldier uh, has been taken captive, for example. 
Uh, and let's say the, the enhanced soldier has been enhanced in such a way as to provide him or her with greater uh, low um, uh, light vision, so basically night vision. Then putting that person in a very brightly lit room, such as this, might actually uh, amount to torture or inhumane treatment, whereas that would not necessarily be the case with, uh, with, with normal soldiers who haven't been enhanced. So it does play a role, and I think it goes both ways. Thank you, thank you. Um, Ian, from an operational point of view, what, what impact, and this is a bit more of a um, conceptual question, but what impact would having enhanced soldiers in a, um, in a military scenario for the morale of those who are unenhanced. I mean, what do you think? I know from um, spending lots of time engaging and talking to the Defence Forces, soldier morale and the capacity to build cohesive units together is really, really important, part of the whole operational um, strategy. So I'm wondering, is there any sort of views you might have? Would you be creating first citizens, second citizens? Sort of just wanted you, to, you could reflect on that issue. I'm not sure that it would be significantly different from now. Uh, we have a broad spectrum of people in the military, certainly across the three services. Uh, then you have everything from you know, cooks and bottle washers through to special forces. Uh, and the easiest way to find out whether there's a pilot in the room is they'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, well, which part of the military are you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't think just the sheer fact that there's some potential there. It would start to play out uh, perhaps on how those people contributed to capability, because mm. that, that's what it generally comes down to, that if someone is making a contribution that is valued, then you're less uh, concerned about their background, except for when you're in the mess or somewhere else, and there's the normal divisions. But on the particularly on the battlefield, uh, then there will be roles for both enhanced and unenhanced for the foreseeable future, um, because in the same way that not everyone becomes special forces. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. And uh, finally, um, Ned, you did flag very briefly, and then you sort of said we could take it later, and I'll take you up on that offer, the issue about informed consent. And as I was reflecting about tonight, um, for those of you who are not from, um, at least from Melbourne, um, we have a very passionate sport here called Australia, AFL, Australian Rules Football. And um, there's been some really interesting debates, both in the media, but I think amongst sports ethicists, about enhancement drugs and issues about um, the consent of individuals who, as part of a team, might get injected with something we're not sure about. And there is quite an interesting parallel between this, this debate and, and how we as a society want to see those people who are, are sports um, people with, to some degree, different ideas in relation to how we see our military, which is always going to be an extension of, of society. Militaries obviously always have to reflect society because they're out there um, being an extension and, and implementing particular policies. So um, thinking about the informed consent as having a young son myself who goes off and plays footy and as a mum what I would feel if he got injected with a substance to make him play better but the impact upon that. What, what are your reflections briefly on the issue of soldiers and conformed, informed consent? Thanks, it's a good question. Um, so in an all volunteer military force consent is relevant at one level, namely uh, you've got a consent to join. Once you do join, what's the nature of that consent? It's been described by military historian Sir John Hackett as being an unlimited liability contract. <laughs> right? So when you consent to join the military, you waive all of your ordinary civilian rights and liberties. There's no limit to the sacrifice that you can legitimately be ordered to make for the sake of the military. And that goes all the way from training to deployment and combat. So from the time that uh, you, you went to training, what, what you eat, when and where you sleep, 
uh, how your hair is groomed, how your facial hair is groomed, who you date, which cultural events you attend, which vaccines you take, all of those things are settled by the directives of superiors. When you go to combat, think about this as a, as a stark contrast be, between what we find in ordinary civilian occupations and the military. In ordinary civilian occupations, uh, part of your right to occupational health and safety is the right to refuse imminently dangerous instructions. So if your boss says to you, climb that scaffold, there's a cyclone, it's unstable, you know you're going to die if you climb it, you can always legitimately resist and the law will protect you. In the military, by contrast, you only have a right of conscientious disobedience, meaning if your commanding officer tells you go and machine gun those civilians, you can refuse that order. But you can never refuse an order on grounds of personal safety or self-preservation. So if you're given an order which requires that you make the ultimate sacrifice, as they call it. So you're giving an, given an order which, if you follow it, you know you will die, or it can reasonably be expected, you're not allowed to refuse. You're not allowed to refuse that order. Right? Now, it seems to me that if we think that that's a justifiable arrangement, and, and mil many military e ethicists think that it is. So for example, if you read Michael Waltz's Just and Unjust Wars, he runs this line. He says, when you enter the military, you surrender your rights, or more specifically, you exchange your human rights for war rights. All of these rights that we civilians have, you jettison those, and what you get is a right to kill other combatants and a right to be treated as the conventions require if you're captured and made a prisoner of war. But that's it. Now, my answer to your question would be, if we think that that's a legitimate arrangement, if we think that soldiers can legitimately be ordered to um, follow suicidal directives, it seems to me strange to then say that there's some unique ethical issue that's raised by uh, ordering soldiers to subject themselves to this enhancement. So if soldiers can legitimately be ordered to make the ultimate sacrifice, it seems uh, that it logically follows that they can legitimately be ordered to make sac sacrifices beneath the ultimate sacrifice and and to take risks beneath the ultimate sacrifice. So if we think it's, it's legitimate to treat soldiers in the ways that we currently treat them, I don't, I don't think that there's any real unique issue that's raised by enhancement and forcing enhancements on soldiers without their informed consent. Having said that, you might not agree with the current arrangement. You might think that this is terribly problematic and archaic to treat soldiers as though they're instruments that lose their humanity by signing a bit of paper. But then your problem has nothing to do with enhancement. Specifically, you've got a more general objection, and this would be a part of it. And I, I fall into that latter camp. I wrote a, an article for the Canberra Times last year challenging this idea that soldiers surrender their rights and actually got a lot of stick by the person that's now Chief of Defence, uh, Mark B Biskin. So you can, you can chase that up in your own time. It's, it's entertaining, I promise. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Once again, the, the panellists have shown their, their capacity to reflect on these things. But now's the chance for you as the audience to, uh, to actually either, if you could be very brief, give your own brief views or, um, or ask a question. But I might see if I can go to anyone online first. Um, my colleague Leonard will be reading the online input. Yes, thank you, Helen. Um, we do have a couple of questions online. So maybe I'll take one first and see how we go. It's from uh, a, viewer, a viewer called uh, Tarek uh, Bilani, and uh, his question is, is a new convention or protocol to deal with the rules of conduct with respect to human enhance enhancements required, or does the answer lie in existing agreements? Anyone like to? Uh... I, have a, I have a preliminary view, which is because uh, human enhancement can't be treated as a discrete conceptual box. The answer has to be no, uh, because unlike something like a blinding laser weapon where you were looking at the effect, anti-personnel landmine where you could at least look at it as a single type of technology, here you're looking at a, such a broad range that it would almost be impossible to group it up. But that's not to say that there won't be a need to identify potentially new laws for certain classes of technology. But I don't think we can treat it 
as such a homogenous group that you could come up with one treaty or protocol. Thank you. I might actually just take one more online, if that's possible. We have another question from uh, Etienne Kutzner online, who asks, how would the use of drug erasing memory of soldiers affect the collection of evidence for possible post-conflict criminal prosecution? Over to the panel. Very dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, it certainly would affect uh, the, 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 the capacity to collect evidence, but um, uh, perhaps the issue goes even deeper than that. What would then be the capacity of people who have taken these drugs uh, to be punished for their actions? Because criminal law is fundamentally based on the idea that a person understands, uh, you know, can tell right from wrong and will be able to, to tell at the point of a trial and a punishment what they are punished for. And that is the reason why we, we, we don't uh, uh, punish people who um, uh, have a certain mental defect that, that prevents them from fully participating in their trial. You have the same case here. You, will, you might then be punishing a person who absol has absolutely no concept about what they did wrong. They have no recollection of, of what they did. And the question then is, would that be just uh, to the individual uh, uh, accused? But of course, the practical problem would be, of course, with these drugs that people simply uh, do not remember what happened and have no clear recollection of a particular incident that might be subject to criminal proceedings um, afterwards. Do you want to come uh, just, Please. Uh, coming on that, uh, I remember when I was studying philosophy, some of the bioethicists will draw a distinction between being a human and being a person. So what th there is uh, the kind of gen genetic makeup that makes you a human being, a member of the species Homo sapiens, and then there's all of the personal attributes that make you, you, right? And we might get to a point, uh, I mean, depending on how far you take these kinds of memory uh, uh, wiping technologies, uh, where you've wiped so much of this person's memory, you've wiped out so many of their unique attributes and traits uh, and habits and dispositions that it's no longer the same person that you're dealing with. Right? You now have a new person. That person ac occupies the same body. It's the same human, but it's a different person. And that would raise a whole other set of issues to do with punishing. You wouldn't, you would, you wouldn't simply be punishing this person for things that they don't remember. Uh, you would be punishing this person for c crimes committed by somebody else right? that, that happens to occupy their body. And this is something uh, in, the, in the distant future, presumably, if we even get to that point. But that's something I might add. Thank you. Um, audience, anyone in the audience? Uh, up the back there. And as I said, if you don't mind uh, waiting until you get the microphone, we can record you in all the glorious technology. Hi, uh, thank you to the panel. I don't want to paint myself as a doom and gloom, doom and gloom speculator here, but uh, given that obviously a lot of these proposed human enhan enhancements are inherently dual use, uh, do you think that there should be significant concern that with the increased prominence of private military contractors uh, on modern battlefields that uh, the presence of enhanced warfighters might become a uh, fait accompli and that it may not be a matter of whether or not it's legally regulated, it will just happen anyway. Yeah. I, I think almost certainly for the reasons that you've mentioned in the same way that uh, the problem with bans versus regulation is when things get banned, it gets pushed into the underground black market. When things are regulated, there's some control over their uh, use and dissemination, shall we say. Uh, so as you indicate, as Given that the technology is likely to evolve and develop anyhow, uh, then the better approach for a number of reasons, not least of which will be the individuals themselves. So, you know, they're not subject to 
black market material. But I think we should also be thinking about it that it's not as though all the things we're mentioning are inherently bad. Uh, if you have a better, uh, less fear on the battle space, then you're hopefully less likely to shoot someone who's low threat if you have a better opportunity to reflect first. If you have enhanced senses, then again, you might have better observation, uh, better hearing, again, better able to detect friend from foe from civilian. So we shouldn't approach the issue from, well, there are all these concerns, so let's stop it. Uh, rather, like a lot of military um, technologies or technologies that are also adopted by the military, it's a matter of working out how can it further enhance both military performance, military necessity, and compliance with the law of armed conflict, IHL, rather than trading one off for the other. I think the observation about private military contractors is an important one because it comes as, brings us back to one of the points that, that Ned made earlier on about the question whether enhancements uh, should be reversible. Because if you look at where private military contractors often get their staff, they get them from the uh, National Armed Forces of States. So basically retired soldiers take up employment as security guards with uh, private military and security contractors. So there will be a flood of that technology, if you will, away from the National Armed Forces um, to various private contractors, whose, and, and the, 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 so the ex-soldiers' enhancements will then be put at the disposal of the, um, the highest uh, uh, bidder, if you will. So that sort of raises the question of whether these enhancements should be reversible or should we be looking for uh, a more even more effective regulation of private military contractors? And, and to add one more nuance to that, um, states have in place fairly elaborate regimes controlling defense exports. Uh, so control measures for taking military technology out of the country. So if a company in Australia wishes to produce uh, goods that have a military purpose, and export them overseas, they need to get a license. What about an enhanced ex-soldier? Should the travel abroad be licensed? Because the person has capabilities or inbuilt technology that has a direct military purpose. That's perhaps just one other example of how the, the, the reversibility question relates to it, uh, another regime of international law and also domestic law as well. Nothing to add. Okay, great. Any other questions? On the other side. Um, I was just wondering about um, how how decisions are made about what kinds of uh, weapons are, 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 are usable and aren't. I suppose you know biological or chemical weapons are, are illegal, but blowing someone's limb from limb isn't. Um, and military technology seems to just get better and better at blowing people limb from limb, that, that that's OK. Um, I, wonder, I wonder whether te the te technology could be used for, um, well, weapons could be developed that incapacitate soldiers rather than killing them. That would cle clearly be a better, a better sort of solution to the whole thing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be more ethical, like blinding the soldiers than, than killing them? I mean, I don't know, just a thought. <laughs> Uh, may I do a little spruiking for this fabulous review because one of the members of the audience here tonight, Eve Messingham, actually wrote an article in relation to a conflict without casualties, a note of caution, non-lethal weapons and IHL. So you'll certainly be able to have a read of that and uh, get some more, uh, more details about the, the complexity of the debate about non-lethal weapons. But um, it's a really important one on this technology issue, so I'll throw it back to the... Never ever uh, do I lose a chance to, to spruik the review. But uh, I'll throw it back to the panellists for, uh, for their views. A colleague of mine, Steve Coleman, works a lot on non-lethal weapons. Uh, and the, the assumption is that they're more, they're more humane, obviously, because they uh, 
uh, help you fight the enemy without blowing them to bits. Um, but there are, uh, are some uh, difficulties with that assumption uh, if you look at some of the way that these non-lethals are tested. So there's, there's one, one piece of non-lethal, one non-lethal technology, I think it's called the active denial system. And if you look at it, it's just a truck with a big laser gun on the top of it. It's a heat ray, right? It's, it's something in, an evil genius thought up. That's what it looks like. <laughs> uh, and when they deploy it, uh, what it does is it, it burns the very top layer of your skin, or it causes the water molecules on your skin to bubble, right? And it's, it's so excruciatingly painful that when they point the heat gun at these protesters, they all flee, right? Uh, and they say, look, we've managed to disperse this violent crowd through non-violent means when, or through non-lethal means when we might otherwise have had to just drop a, a cluster bomb on them. Seems like a good thing. Uh, but s some people have more recently poked holes in this whole analysis saying, uh, what about under non-ideal conditions? So for example, what if you've got a person uh, at whom you're directing this heat ray uh, and they're incapacitated. They can't get out of the way, right? We haven't been able to test, because you can't get ethics, ethics, ethics clearance for that kind of testing, to see what would happen to this person if they sit under the heat of this, this ray gun for a sustained period of time. But I take your point about there being something odd about, if I may say something about uh, the regulation of weapons. You've got these conventions which prohibit, say, biological weapons and, and chemical weapons. Uh, but they don't prohibit ordinary uh, incendiary weapons and so on and so forth. Um, there was a, an article recent, uh, written recently by a guy called Fritz Alhoff uh, pointing out the inconsistencies in this or the, the puzzling logic of some of this. So you might, if I understand correctly, there's, there's a particular biological or chemical weapon um, or a, a weapon that produces something called a brown noise. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. But you deploy this weapon at the enemy and they lose control of their bowels, right? And now they want to run off to the bathroom or whatever. And so you take them out of action or the combat, right? Uh, according to the current legal regulations, apparently, this sort of thing is prohibited. So it would be preferable legally to kill this person uh, rather than to make them run off to the, to the loo. So there seems to be something odd and something puzzling about this arrangement, if I've got that right. But maybe the other panelists can, can clarify if I've got the details right there. I know little of the brown weapon, uh, <laughs> but I'd say that the driver for weapons regulation and weapons banning is two, two track. Uh, one is preventing harm to civilians. Uh, one is preventing unnecessary suffering to combatants. And it has to be kept in mind that weapons are prohibited or regulated for either, or sometimes both, but for two different reasons. Uh, it's a state function uh, at the end of the day. You know, it's states who negotiate treaties. But if you look at chemical biological weapons, there's a broad concern about the spillover effect onto the civilian population. Uh, same with anti-personnel landmines. If you look at blinding laser weapons, that's a weapon that was specifically regulated for its effect on combatants. Uh, which did leave the option of killing them uh, rather than blinding them. But it's important to draw the distinction between the two reasons. Uh, otherwise, it can be confusing as to why does this particular treaty exist and not that one. But then ultimately, because it becomes a matter of negotiation between states, a lot depends on the view of military utility at the time or the public perception at the time. Has a war just occurred or not? So how much interest uh, the various governments around the world have. Uh, but I will say that my speciality is in applying the law of armed conflict uh, as opposed to creating it. Uh, if I could just make a couple of further observations on that. One problem with non-lethal we uh, 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 weapons, and I'm sure that argument is much more eloquently made in the International Review, is that they are often not non-lethal. Uh, it's a question about dosage. So how do you actually prohibit a particular chemical agent only in doses that are lethal and not in doses that um, induce sleep, uh, etc.? So there's a practical difficulty in trying to get this 
create this sort of multi-layered regime where a particular chemical is used when it uh, produces certain kinds of effects. And of course, the effects of a particular chemical are very difficult to, to predict uh, at any rate. And the other observation I would make is that the, the treaties that uh, prohibit particular types of weapons often do not follow strict logic. Uh, part of the reason is what Ian just pointed out. There are strategic concerns involved uh, in banning or limiting the use of a particular kind of weapon. And another point, and I apologize to, to those of you who here who have heard me go on and on about this before, is that um, some means of warfare are not banned because they are inhumane, but they're banned because of certain other considerations. Um, and one of the considerations that I would highlight is military honor, or chivalry as it used to be called. So for example, the, the prohibition of poison, which exists in, modern, in the modern law of armed conflict, and which has expanded to the prohibition of chemical and uh, biological weapons, uh, has a far longer history than the notion of um, humane warfare as we understand it today. So it goes back uh, further into uh, military practice, and it was originally tied to the notions of what is an honorable way of um, attacking the enemy. So some rules of the law of armed conflict or arms control law uh, can actually better be explained by the strategic and historical considerations rather than by the actual um, uh, implications on humanity of the particular weapon. Take the prerogative as a chair. I think the question you're asking is a really important one, and I'm sure all of us in the room who are IHL lawyers would have never sat through a dinner party with someone saying, I don't understand it. You can machine gun down someone, but you can't use a landmine. I think what, what happens often is a confusion between the laws to war, the use of force itself, and the laws in war. Because if gloriously we could actually ban all machine guns and all guns, then you're talking about actually banning the essence of uh, use of force and conflict itself. So it, it is a sort of a philosophical difference where you say, OK, um, if there is going to be armed conflict, is there is going to be a way that, that people are going to uh, uh, fulfil a military objective by force, what is the regulation of what we find acceptable and unacceptable? And as was said by Ian, very often it deals with the impact on civilians and others. So it's just, uh, I wanted to flag that because it's a really important issue. Whenever we're talking about the regulation of weapons, it's almost counterintuitive sometimes when you look at the things that are. But you see more recently work on areas such as small arms, which are... Um, were deemed to need to have some sort of regulation in their transfer, not because of the intrinsic weapon itself, but how they're used and how they impact upon society and, and, and that other thing. So it's a really, I mean, we could definitely do a, a, a whole further discussion on the philosophical issues about how one goes about dealing with these weapons. Okay, now I, I've got a, um, a question up there. That... What I was wondering is, oh, there we go, hi. Um, what I was wondering is, what do you see as being at stake in this debate? Now, I'm going to come at this from two perspectives, but I believe that they are the one perspective, but at different angles. So, perspective one was our discussion of the so-called brown note, um, which a friend of mine has just pointed out, um, does not work and has not worked and has been parodied in an episode of South Park. Um, so. That's fine and it's hilarious, but on the other hand, there was a slippage in the ethicists' comments about this, which went straight from military weapons to using these technologies against protesters. So I'm not sure if this was something you noticed or was a Freudian slip. Hey, the unconscious bubbles up and surprises us all. But there seems to be a politics here about weapons usage, which is directed to the politics of international humanitarian law. Point one. Point two is that we're talking about human um, enhancement and we haven't yet really talked about what it is that constitutes a technology nor what it is that constitutes a human enhanced by that technology. And these are the questions which have been buzzing in, in my head, right? We've used human enhancement technologies in various forms for as long as there have been humans, right? Let's take something like weightlifting as a technique or a method which enhances the human who applies it. Let's also take military drills. Um, as a way of enhancing the way that humans cooperate together. We could also add playing music together as an, another version 
of the same. So given that we live in a world where the joint strike fighter doesn't quite do what it was supposed to do, um, and Robocop doesn't quite exist, what is it that we're talking about in the view of the panel? When we're talking about human enhancement, are we talking about peptide use? Are we talking about a continuity of strategies and tactics for improving the human and improving modes of doing warfare? And what are we talking about when there's an easy slippage between talking about the human and talking about the object against which these weapons and these increasingly weaponized forms of being human um, are employed? Thank you. Fabulous. I will throw this over to the panel. Before I'll do that, I'll just let you know um, I've got a little list here as the chair of some of the examples of the use of um, enhancement that I might flag to allow my, my colleagues to have some thinking time. Just some examples. Um, some had been uh, mentioned by the panellists, but the use of pharmaceuticals and dietary supplements to improve operational performances, which, you know, we all sometimes feel like we need a Barocca, but I think this is at a higher level. Um, the use of neuroscience to develop um, telepathetic, telepathetic communication abilities and improve stress resilience. So there's obviously a lot of research going on in relation to that. Um, the, what's called the geoskin, which is a use of synthetic version of animal systems that is working towards replicating the capacity for the ability to scale up walls vertically without having to use um, ropes or um, ladders or other things. So there's some research going on in relation to that. Um, and the capacity to improve soldiers' ability to analyse visual data by assisting them to identify visual threats. So some of it moves along the continuum of whether it be um, you know, doing push-ups and parading for hours and learning to stand very still. And others really does move much more beyond um, the capacity of how we are using things such as nanotechnology, which is quite advanced in, um, in the, the very quick moving of molecules, if I can put it bluntly, which almost creates at times elements of invisibility around the edges. So um, very good question. We should have probably defined exactly what we're talking about right at the start. But I think the, the idea about the continuum and the spectrum is, is an important one. So I um, thought I'd throw it over to the panelists for some, um, some reflections on the questions. Uh, at least from my perspective, when asked to be on the panel, the distinction I drew in my mind was between something that basically is achievable by people without the benefit of specific technology and something that moves beyond that. So going from the uncorrected vision to something that just isn't achievable, so seen in a spectrum that isn't available to the human eye, having a radio in effect built into your ear, and moving again beyond uh, something that can be broadly achieved with normal drugs uh, to direct electrostimulation of the brain in ways that generally weren't envisaged at least for the purposes of the law of armed conflict as it's developed to date. So it's not so much for me uh, about the specifics of the technology as more when we created rules and for instance said that when someone's taken prisoner of war uh, you're to leave them with their clothing and their normal um, equipment. Well, what if that's been fused into them so you can no longer take their battlefield radio off them easily? Therefore, noting that we have said, you know, it's not a single class, rather it's, OK, if I was asked to do a legal analysis of this, what distinguishing characteristics would I be interested in? Uh, same when we've looked at other technologies like autonomous weapon systems and the like, where you're not interested generally in the weapon, but how the decision to employ that weapon's being made. You've got to find the thing that's legally significant. I'm certain that for different purposes, there'll be something that's more ethically significant. Uh, and therefore, we won't always be approaching the question from the same angle, because what's of importance to myself doing a legal review will be different from what's important to providing ethical advice. And that's why you have two different 
um, people talking on the same topic. I, I fully agree with your point that the concept of, of enhancement is a, is a tricky one, and that was something that I tried to get to with my, with my examples earlier on. But just to elaborate on, on that a bit further, I mean, it's difficult to tell enhancement apart from, from certain other things that we do. So where does the line go between enhancement and mere tool? So for example, a, 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 a night vision device used quite commonly in the armed forces, is, is that a human enhancement or is that merely a tool? Um, but what if we manage to build that safe capability into the person, would then that make it an enhancement? So there's a question about how close the person actually is to the device and to what extent the device is being integrated. There's the problem of, of where does correction or, or, or treatment become um, enhancement. The classic example here is vaccination. Is vaccination against some un, uh, disease unknown in Australia? Um, when we provide vaccinations against that to Australian soldiers, is that enhancing them or is that a, a, a form of preventative um, therapy? Uh, and finally, uh, the, the, the question about you know, weightlifting and building muscle mass, there's probably a line somewhere between being very diligent in going to the gym and taking steroids that sets sort of normal training apart uh, uh, from enhancement. Where that line goes is, is, is a sort of a, it's, it's an interesting question, but I, I, I tend to agree that it probably, the line shifts depending on what the legal question is that we're trying to answer in uh, particular circumstances. Great, thank you. We might take, if we've got another one online, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. And I do encourage people to hashtag new tech if they wish to ask one. This is uh, from the humanitarian group online, with emphasis added, shall I say. What does human enhancement mean for the modern soldier or the modern humanitarian? Excellent. I was reflecting on that myself. We've got to put the humanitarian space in there. It's a, it's a similar question that comes up with other new military technologies. So, for example, the increased drone use is seen as something uh, particularly vicious and horrible and dehumanizing warfare and so on and so forth. But it's also possible that some modern technologies will make it more likely for states to engage in various humanitarian operations, such as, for example, peacekeeping or peace enforcement operations where there's a danger uh, to the uh, uh, personnel of the state involved in, in, in these missions. So some of these technologies might actually make it more likely uh, for states to undertake benevolent uh, military operations, if you will. And the same probably applies to enhancement technologies as well. While we can, on the one hand, see them as potentially a, a, a process of dehumanizing warfare, on the other hand, it may lead to more uh, effective soldiers who can better achieve humanitarian objectives uh, in armed conflict. So enhancement in that context might actually be uh, a, a net good to, to strive for. Just uh, picking up on uh, one of those points, so coming back to the, the idea of the unlimited liability contract, uh, that often, that's often qualified in the following way. Uh, soldiers sign up for unlimited, unlimited liability, but they sign up to serve their country and its vital national interests. So that, that's the account of the unlimited liability contract that's offered by uh, Martin Cook of the US uh, Naval Academy. And what that means is soldiers don't sign up to fight for the human rights of foreigners. If there's going to be a humanitarian intervention, there has to be a coinciding national interest rationale. You're breaking your contract with your soldiers by sending him, sending him into a benevolent or a purely altruistic mission, right? And now he adds the following qualification. If we can come up with methods and means of warfare which would allow our soldiers to conduct these humanitarian operations in a way that is risk-free, or some people are throwing around the term post-heroic, um, then that would be justified, right? Because there they're not bearing any ad ad additional risk. Right, so I, I think you're right that this is still a, a, a dominant view a, a, among many military ethicists that a humanitarian intervention is beyond the scope of the remit of 
the, the military's authority over its soldiers. And therefore, and therefore they're, inc they're disinclined to engage in humanitarian intervention to begin with. And when they do engage in humanitarian intervention, often they'll adopt methods of intervention uh, that are just not suitable to achieving a positive humanitarian outcome. And, and the best example here is probably the case of uh, uh, NATO's intervention into Kosovo in the late 1990s. So the ethnic Albanians were being uh, cl ethnically cleansed, forcibly expelled from the Kosovo, popul uh, Kosovo region in Yugoslavia. Uh, Western publics were horrified by what was going on. NATO governments responded by uh, initiating this intervention. And the intervention consisted of 11 weeks of high altitude bombing. Right? So no ground forces, no low-flying low aircraft were deployed. And the mission statement itself said, the top priority in this mission is force protection. Right? Because we're not willing to sustain military casualties for the sake of a purely altruistic, benevolent humanitarian intervention. Now, if military enhancements, uh, human enhancements, could potentially reduce the risks, minimize the risks of our engagement in these kinds of operations, then I think uh, Rain is right in that uh, we, we might hope to see more of them and we might hope to see them conducted in a way that is more conducive to the outcome that we're trying to achieve. I'd like to dig a little deeper for a second because I think we also want to reflect on not just the use of uh, these technologies by the military, but just for a moment think about the capacity for the humanitarian sector to use some of these um, technologies. And I'm just wondering, in the increasing asymmetrical nature of warfare, what are the costs of these sort of technologies um, and do you think they would become available um, more widely? So if you've got enhanced soldiers, do you see a perception that you might have enhanced humanitarians <laughs> who um, don't, fear as, don't feel as, um, as scared? Um, I mean, you look at the same issues and you flip them over, that can go in and provide assistance in an environment that maybe traditionally um, the good old security guys back in the offices would say, oh, it's too dangerous. So, do you think there's anything other than, than cost, or do you think these things will be um, widely painted, painted, be available more widely, or do you think it's going to be held on very tightly by those who want to make a lot of money? Uh, because of the second one, it will become widely available. Um, you, you make money by selling <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, it'll be a force multiplier for humanitarians. If you have exoskeletons that allow you to carry extra weight, uh, and you have a recruiting problem. <laughs> you know, there's only so many people who want to go into, say, part of the Congo at a given time. Um, then one person can do the work of three. Mm -hmm. yeah. so certainly, we <laughs> things that have to be considered when when developing various enhancement techniques and technologies is a they will potentially end up in the hands of the people with whom you might end up in conflict. Um, and on the other hand, that those technologies might actually be used in um, a civilian context. And the, 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 there, are, there are many technological developments originating from the armed forces, uh, many of them very, very useful ones, uh, that are regularly used uh, in civil society. I mean, uh, internet or Velcro or what have you. Um, so there is certainly the likelihood that some of these en enhancement technologies, when they become more common, in the armed forces will also become more common in the normal society. And that is a, a, a risk, if you will, that has to be factored into the development of these technologies. But don't think we're the driver of the development, necessarily. Like a, um, one of the drugs out there for calming nerves is for surgeons. Um, and the military might find a military application for it as opposed to the reverse. Mm. Exactly. I think to sort of shake it, I think we focused a bit on the military use, which is important. But I think, as you said, these are, these are broader philosophical questions about society, which has to engage in any debate in relation to the military. I saw a question, someone, the few popped up as we were having that debate. Um, Hello. Oh. <laughs> My question was uh, in regards to the uh, internal conflict and enhanced soldiers, especially relevant with all the repressive regimes and sort of civilian overthrow, and would that even be imaginable with an enhanced military personnel? And isn't that an ethical consideration? 
The, the answer is yes, um, as in would it be feasible for... Uh, look at Syria, where you start with a very low-tech, capable um, uh, civilian force and a reasonably capable, reasonably um, technologically uh, equipped military force. Uh, and how long has the conflict been going for now? Three, four three years? Uh, and to and fro in. So um, we, we've used words like, you know, super soldier, I think, once or twice. But th that's not significantly different from someone having access to military-designed equipment compared with uh, stuff that they have had to develop themselves. So I don't think it'll be a revolution in military affairs, which is the term we tend to use. It, it won't suddenly be unstoppable forces uh, compared with um, people who can just be easily and suddenly killed. Uh, look, look, look at Afghanistan. Um, so the, the, the might of the, the most advanced technolo military technological uh, state in the form of the United States, plus all its uh, supporting forces, are still fighting over a decade later. So the technology presumably will assist. I mean, that, that's why it'll uh, be fielded or not. But one, there'll be countermeasures. Um, so it's, it's one thing to have night vision, uh, it's another thing to be blinded because the other person then just puts up lots of flares um, or whatever. So uh, I don't think it'll be a game changer in, in that sense. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, thank you all for a very interesting presentation. This is directed predominantly at Captain Henderson, but I'd be interested to get the rest of the panel's view. What do you think the consequence will be in terms of the principle of proportionality uh, for enemy forces making, or the rather the inability to make a distinction between an enhanced and an unenhanced soldier? Um, do you feel that they would be able to reasonably exercise more force because they are possibly encountering an enhanced enemy, or that there will be additional set of rules, um, or is it essentially does it to create two sets of, of, of legal um, principles that militaries have to operate by? Uh, again, I don't think it'll be that significant to be a game changer in the foreseeable future. Uh, take everything from uh, your poor Air Force lawyer to your highly trained, extremely capable Special Forces um, corporal. Uh, at the moment, we would, the, the principle of proportionality and the application of it uh, is broad enough that you're hardly going to say, well, the Special Forces Corporal is the equivalent of three civilian deaths and two houses, whereas the Air Force lawyer is only uh, a slight injury to one civilian and damage to their vehicle. I mean, it, it's just not that finely balanced. And because it isn't, to make a distinction between uh, an a soldier with unenhanced vision and one with a bionic eye that allows them to see out an extra 100 metres without the use of binoculars. Uh, I don't see being that significant. So that's why I, to some extent, am more interested in some of these other rules rather than the distinction rule and the proportionality rule and the unnecessary suffering because the broad enough in their application to, to be flexibly applied already uh, until we reach the point of you know, a full-on robocop. Uh, uh, until it's at the point where that one person represents the equivalent of you know, a full battalion otherwise. Mm -hmm. But why we're just talking about someone having a radio in their ear or the ability to operate for 48 hours without sleep uh, but still have a high cognitive ability. That's just not, it's qualitative, sorry, it's quantitative in a small amount but it's not a big qualitative change. Thank you.
Great. Well, um, I believe we're going to have a, a, someone come and say thank you. Is it um, our new Director of International Law and Policy from Australian Red Cross, Dr. Dr. Phoebe Wynne Pope is going to uh, conclude the evening for us. But can I say, and I'm sure on behalf of the panelists, we're really, really um, delighted that uh, not only did you, uh, do you listen, and I couldn't see anyone asleep, and I don't know out there in cyberland, I suppose you could be snoozing off, but the quality of the questions and the engagement was really exciting. So thank you everyone here and out there in the uh, virtual world for really engaging with us. I think it's uh, been a lot of fun and, and we could go for many hours, but then we'd probably need those drugs that keep us awake for 48 hours. We could we could take them and really talk about it, but um, <laughs> perhaps not. Um, so I'd like to pass it over to uh, Dr. Wynne Pope. Thank you very much, Helen. I think we should be sticking to the brockers probably just for now. Um, it's my great pleasure. It's always such a lovely job to do the thank yous at the end of the evening. And um, I want to particularly thank all of our online participants who have um, been sitting there. I know it's always difficult sitting at home and, and not being actually in the room and getting the feeling of interest. And I think that some of the things that our panellists have talked about tonight have um, certainly opened a lot of eyes to a lot of the new issues around new technologies and um, and I'd really like to thank each and every one of you very much for your contributions. I think that the, the, the legal, the operational and the ethical dilemmas that are facing, um, that always face armed conflict are enhanced, um, maybe not artificially, but enhanced in any case by some of these issues. But we can remember that the people that are being enhanced are still people and we can always bring many of the issues back to the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law around distinction, about identifying um, lawful combatants and, um, and non-combatants and civilians and, and people who are able to be um, the, the, the principles around these things and remembering that enhanced humans are still at, at their core going to be human. Um, I'd like to really thank the uh, ICRC for putting on this series in Melbourne as part of their international series on new technologies and um, armed conflict. And to, um, to finally thank, if we could all thank our super, super panelists and um, wish Dr. Helen Durham a, um, a, a great time. We're losing her in Australia to uh, the ICRC and off, she's off to Geneva. So we'd like to thank her especially for participating and hosting this panel just before she departs. So thank you very much to all our panelists.